This reading from Acts chapter 10 has a key message for us, and it is that all of us have a social web of relationships. Whether you live on your own or whether you have a massive family, the truth about our humanity is we all have a web of human relationships. And I spoke last time about finding people of favour. I don't, I don't want you to give away names, but did anyone think, yeah, that's a person of favour? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes, some firm yeses. What did I mean by person of favour? It's a person who may not be a Christian, they may not be a believer in Jesus, but they are open and actually positively encouraging of either what you're doing, the church is doing, or the kingdom is doing. And I want, if you weren't here last time, you can catch up uh, on the website, but I also want to encourage you, think about those people and pray about them. Because we see another one here. Cornelius is such a man. Verse 22 in our reading, he is a God-fearing, righteous man. Now, it doesn't mean he knows God, <laughs> but he's God-fearing. And we maybe know people who are open to the idea of God, to the idea of Jesus Christ, of the Holy Spirit, but they're not quite there. They're not quite, well, can I put it this way? They're not quite here in our community. And we're not looking to gather a big community so that we can feel important, but we are looking to increase and see the kingdom of God grow. And what we see about Cornelius is that he hasn't yet found Jesus, but he has had an angelic visitation. Earlier in the story, we see that an angel appears and says, you call for Peter. And he does, which is, means he's a man of favour. Because when someone says to you, would you talk to me? Would you pray for me? Would you just come and spend some time with me? Tell me about your faith. I don't get it. They're a man or woman of favour. Because what you have in front of you is an opportunity. And we see that Peter obediently goes. He doesn't say, oh, they won't believe me, or I'll get laughed at, or no, I'm not, I'm not able to preach. I think probably everybody here is able to speak which is a gift, in, in fact, isn't it? To be able to have the, the gift of a voice. You can talk about your faith. You do not need a minister with you because you are one. Amen, somebody nearly said then. <laughs> so talk. Talk about your faith. Talk about your experience. Talk about your life. Talk about what you've discovered. And that, in essence, is what happens here in this story. Peter, with some of the other brothers, it says, go to see him because they too have been told to go and see him. So an angel has come to Cornelius and Peter has felt the Holy Spirit say to him, go and see this bloke. And you see the beauty of the Holy Spirit preparing the man of favour, but also preparing the man of faith. So your part is to go and speak. Their part is to be ready to hear. Does that make sense? Yeah. Brilliant. It's all ready for you. It's done. I have a sister, just the one. <laughs> and um, I remember vividly, my sister used to go to something called Crusaders. And it was one of the biggest Crusaders groups in Hampshire. Now, you know, Hampshire is a place where hurricanes hardly ever happen. You do know this, don't you? <laughs> it is the best county after Cornwall in the country. I said that with gritted teeth. She went to the biggest crusaders group in Hampshire, in fact, in the southeast of England. And I remember before she started going, and then afterwards. And you can say to me, what do you mean? Well, she was a supercilious sister. She would roll her eyes at her younger brother. That was me. She would do all those sisterly things that really bugged you, like not playing cricket with you, <laughs> spoiling all the fun. She used to get her sweets and she'd put them in a bowl and she'd eat them over the next five hours. And I would eat mine in one go. That's so irritating. <laughs> and then she went to Crusaders and they were a fantastic group, just amazing group of young people, just like some of our young, young folk. 
open to God, wanting to learn, open to the Holy Spirit. And I realized she was changing. And she became this wonderfully caring, sympathetic, and genuinely kind sister. And any of you who've got sisters, yeah, older sisters, that's rare. Until they, until they get older. And you know, I was not a Christian, though I understood who Jesus was because we went to church. But my sister's example showed me there was something more. It wasn't just about believing in Jesus. It was living the life that the Holy Spirit gave and gives. So knowing about Jesus is not the same as knowing Jesus. Knowing about the Holy Spirit is not the same as having the Holy Spirit within you and speaking to you, as Peter demonstrated. And Peter goes to see Cornelius, and Cornelius gathers his household. And the Greek word here is oikos, and in the, in the titles for the preachers this today, I said, everyone has an oikos. Please hear me, not an oik. <laughs> if you come from the southeast of England, you know what an oik is. I don't know if you have it in, Corn in Cornwall, but not an oik, an oikos, which means household. Every one of you has a household. You may live on your own, but you have a household because it's about social connection. You have a household of people that you connect with, and then Jesus can connect with through you. And Peter, verse 38, speaks to the household about Jesus. He says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, of Nazareth, so was, he was identifying him as a, as a human being who lived in a place called Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And the, the Greek word there is dunamis, which means where we get the word dynamite. So Jesus, the dynamited one from the little village of Nazareth, <clears throat> what did he do next? How he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. It's a gospel message to a man of favour and his household. And lo and behold, they began to receive. And we see part way through Peter's sermon that a miracle happened. And Rowena didn't read this part, but I wanted, I was selfish, Rowena. I wanted to keep it to myself. <laughs> But just listen to these verses, verse 40, 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter, so that's the group from the church, were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, can anyone keep them from uh, what did he say? Being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And so Peter goes to a man of favor who is a Gentile and therefore unclean to the Jews. And he hears the message. And notice there's no commitment to Christ here. There's no sinner's prayer. What was ready? His heart was ready. If your heart is ready this morning, there's no great load of hoops to jump through. It's just accepting what he has just said here, that Jesus died for you on the cross and in great power transforms you into the person you were always meant to be. And that is the miracle of this episode. And as a sign, they spoke in tongues and baptism is a sign of several things. Baptism is a sign of hearing God's word and receiving it in your heart. Now, we have a real confliction, don't we, in terms of baptizing babies? Yeah, that's all right. See, see I always like to expose the grumbles in the church. <laughs> Get it out there. I'm married to a northerner, so it's like, e by gum, let's talk about this, shall we? Sorry, anyone from the north, I'm really sorry. Well, I'm sorry for you, but we baptize babies. You know, the problem with that is it's hanging on a promise of their parents and godparents, which is okay, but it isn't the full Monty. The full Monty is Peter, as he heard the message, something in his heart did a somersault 
and the Holy Spirit came in. You know, I was told as a young Christian, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He never comes in unless he's invited. And so Peter invite, invites the Holy Spirit by his speaking and Cornelius invites the Holy Spirit by his thinking and his receptiveness. And lo and behold, so too do the whole household, the oikos. They stop being oiks and they start being a fatherhood, a, a household of believers. And baptism is public and deliberate, and it's also a choice. And that's why the Church of England has invented confirmation, so that when somebody's made a choice for you, you can ratify it yourself. But do you know, the most important thing here is that baptism was a sign of going forward with Jesus. And I want to ask you a question today. If you haven't been baptised by immersion, I do not mean sprinkling with a shell. <laughs> do you know I've never understood about the shell? Y you know what I mean, don't you? You know, the, the sort of scooping of water. I've never understood about the shell. It's handy on the beach. <laughs> I suppose it helps, you know, a handful doesn't, it dribbles between your fingers. But if you haven't been baptised by immersion, the question is why? Why? Because the call of Jesus is to be baptised by choice, not by tradition or by your parents' will. Although if your parents, and I was baptised as a baby, so, you know, Preachers preach to thyself. My parents wanted good for me. We will never refuse an infant baptism here. But we also want to welcome those who realise that there's a further step of full commitment where we renew our vows in baptism. And I want to ask that question. If there's anybody here who hasn't been baptised in immersion, full immersion, full death and resurrection, why not? And if you want to take that step. And if God's speaking to you about it, then would you like to speak with me? Because I would love to drown you, uh, sorry, immerse you <laughs> with my colleagues and friends. We only hold people down for about 20 minutes. <laughs> and you might think, that's not me. That's not where I am. Well, that's exactly where I thought I was. Kay and I had been married, I think, about 10 years or so. We were in a Baptist church, which is where God led us to be at that particular time. The preacher stood up. He was young and good looking as well. And he said, at the end of the service, I really feel the Lord is saying that there's some people here who are not yet immersed in the fullness of all that God wants. And if you would like to be baptized, then come forward. And I found myself at the front and I found myself someone, I found someone next to me, and lo and behold, there was my wife Kay. And both of us were immersed in the same gathering a few weeks later. And it revolutionized my faith and Kay's faith. It totally transformed how we saw that wonderful song we sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. It deepened and bred and broadened and made us ready for what God wanted. And I really feel today there is someone here, at least one person. And praying this morning, I felt there was a lady here who is, um, it, it, they know exactly what I'm saying, that they need to do it. And I would like to say to that person, and maybe some gentlemen as well, if, if that's you, would you speak to me afterwards? Would you say, that's me? And we'll arrange it. Wherever you're from, we can arrange it. Cornelius here in this passage has a social web of contacts. It's his household. It's his family. Think of your social web. There are friends. There are family. There are colleagues. There are neighbours. There are people who are blood relatives. There are distant relatives. There are old friends you haven't spoken to for years. All of those are your social network. It is your web of people of favour. Now, some of your relatives you may not get on so well with, but it's the people of favour you're looking for. And God made us wired for community. That's why COVID was so devastating for us. Even those of us that are introverted, we got to the point where we needed people. 
didn't we? And that's because you're wired to be in connection with others. And because you're a Christian, and because you've been baptized, and because you're full of the Spirit, you're made to connect for the kingdom. We have various degrees of separation, don't we? Have you heard there was the seven degrees of separation? Yeah, seven degrees of separation means that basically you put a room of people together and they will find degrees of separation that mean they have a relative in the same town or maybe a blood relative and so on and so forth. Just think about the Bible, however, however much you know about the Bible. Think of some of the degrees of separation that God sorted out for his purpose. Joseph became Pharaoh's right hand man, but he was a nobody to begin with. He was actually um, taken prisoner, wasn't he? He was rejected by his family. Esther, wonderful woman of God, became an advisor to the king. Jesus was brought before Pilate, the Roman governor and most important man in that part of the world at that time. Paul was before the Sanhedrin. He was also brought before Felix. He was also brought before um, Festus and King Agrippa. I mean, that's a pretty good CV, isn't it? He was brought before them because he was in trouble. He was a Christian causing trouble. Now I look at you and I know lots of you cause trouble. So use it for the kingdom. Whoever you know, because he was known for the spirit moving in his life. Do you know, I have a one degree, one step separation from myself and Queen Elizabeth. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah you see? She likes Hampshire as well, by the way. No, let me explain. Queen Elizabeth II, our monarch, is patron of this parish. So in order to be appointed here, you have to really be the right sort of person. <coughs> Technically speaking, Queen Elizabeth could come and interview the candidates for this parish. You will not be surprised to hear she didn't on my appointment. <laughs> I have one degree of separation from the monarch of our nation. And technically, as an incumbent here, if I wanted to talk to her about her patronage, I could do so. I have the right because I'm appointed by her. So I'm expected to be treated with great respect. <laughs> And I'm talking to the staff team especially. But isn't that amazing? Who am I? I'm, I'm nobody in the big scale, scale of things. But I have the ear of the queen of this nation, if I so need to. And I've told her all about you. The difficult and the wonderful. And in fact, some of you may remember, I was invited to a garden party my first summer here. And there I was in her presence. I went. And it was amazing. There were 50,000 people there. She didn't know who I was from Adam. But I have a first degree relationship with Queen Elizabeth if I needed it. Isn't that amazing? Because of my relationship with Jesus. So when your household know that you follow Jesus, when your neighbours, when your blood relatives know that you follow Jesus, people of favour fall out of the woodwork and all you have to do is a look for an opportunity to speak or look for an opportunity to love or look for an opportunity to help or look for an opportunity to sit with someone and say nothing. Because the words of God will speak through you. When I was a curate, the very first person I was in the presence of when they died was the wife of the person who started Greg's Bakery. Hands up who has not frequented Greg's Bakery. Oh my word. Oh, of course, we're in Cornwall, aren't we? So it's, it's Rose Bakery or whatever. Okay, a few people haven't. If you live anywhere else in the country, there are Greg's Bakeries. His wife had terminal cancer, and as a curate, my incumbent was away, and I was on duty, so off I went. And I went and sat with his wife, and I read some scripture. And do you know, as I left the room, she died. 
Not when I was there, but as I left the room. So the door closed and I went down the stairs and the lady who was sitting with her said, as you left and went down the stairs, she died. It happens a lot, you know. People need to find their space to leave this world. But I had such a privilege. And Michael, his name is Michael Bragg, and he started Greg's. He, he was so pleased that I visited. He was so much a man of favour that he offered us a skiing holiday. <laughs> he said, well, that's ridiculous. But what it was, was he was a man of favour who appreciated a man of God saying something about Jesus to his wife. It's that simple of just being willing to take the opportunity. So in closing, can we try this? Would you like to go home and get a piece of paper, put your name in the middle, husband and wife if you're married, put your two of you together and draw a spider's web of all the people that you are connected to, all the people who you spend some time either talking with, emailing or living with or next to or working with. Make a spider's web and begin to pray who is a man and woman of favour. Why have you been put in that web? Because you're at the middle, the centre. Why? Why have I got a sister? Why have I got a brother? Why am I married to Kay? Why is her family as they are? It's because God wants you there. And when you begin to do that, you begin to see some people of favour and some people who are closed. And it's the people of favour that you spend your time with until the Holy Spirit says something different. Would you be willing to do that? Just as something to do. Because people often say, how? And I've said, you've got an oikos. Well, write it down. Draw it. Everyone can probably draw it. It's just a circle and spider webs. Begin to pray. And I have a list at the front of my Bible of people I pray for, specifically that God would give me an opportunity. And at the side I write, when they come to Christ. And you will be amazed at how often I'm able to write that they come to Christ. Because God uses you. We have a daughter and a son-in-law in the, on the Isle of Sheppey. And they went to the Isle of Sheppey because it's the home of Matt. And they felt God called them to start a church on the Isle of Sheppey. It started in their living room. And they now have a Monday night meeting. So it's not a service. <laughs> It's a gathering. It's a gathering of people. And they have it in their home, but they also now have to have it in the local church because it's grown. And it's called Ignite. It's a great word. Because they're looking to ignite the kingdom in people's hearts. And I had the privilege of going in November before I had my little ups and downs. And I went on Monday night. And do you know it was great? There were drug addicts. There were difficult people, I mean, similar to here. There were uh, challenging people. There were lovely people. There were single mums. There were uh, teenagers. And one of them came over to me, and I know he's one of the most difficult people. His life has been a mess. He said to me, he leant on me, he was a tall guy, leant on me and said, so you're Matt's father-in-law and Helen's father? I said, yes. I thought he was going to hit me. He said, we love them. I said, why? He said, because they love us. They love us. And he comes along on a Monday and he is an alcoholic. And he's still an alcoholic. But he goes on a Monday and he's loved. And it's a Monday. It's not a Sunday. Is that church? Yes. yes. And so if you have a movement in your heart to start something on another day of the week, do it. But just make sure that Jesus is at the heart of it. And I sat there and I thought, boy, this is a wonderful place. Not just because my daughter and son-in-law were there, but because people were being real. They were talking about their lives. They were talking about what was going on. They were basically talking about how it was for them. That is the key. That's the picture of Cornelius, and that could be our picture too. Shall we pray together?